I think you want to do in the early game, as I did carry, focus on not dying and just try to get as much gold as you can. In the mid game as an AD carry, that's when you start having a bit more power once you get like one or two items and then you can start being more aggressive and you can match the enemy better. Once you get some items, you can actually start doing stuff. You're like the late game insurance as well, so do your best and carry your team. And during late game, well, that's when you reach like your full build and you become like super powerful and that's when pretty much all the weight is on you. So just try not to get caught and try to pump out as much damage as you can. You just kill everyone. You play Aphelios, you make 200 years and right from the face of this game, Nothing left standing in the base as Ents take out the win. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are working towards Barrage versus Monster Rugby Gaming. Not Demise. I, uh, I, I just said <laughs> the wrong thing. It was Monster Rugby Gaming, okay? I, I basically, I got half of it correct. Uh, Barrage are in both of the leagues as well, guys. So, you know, I, I was almost there. Anyway, Barrage versus Monster Rugby Gaming. Let's, uh, let's work into this one. Uh, first of all, elephant in the room. Most people clearly think that Monster Rugby Gaming are the favorites here, except for one little birdie on our analyst desk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Trouble, why yeah. do you <laughs> think Barrage are favored here? It's not necessarily about who's favorite. It's the fact that I have seen glimpses of hope coming out. And I feel like in this particular matchup, Barrage could pull ahead. We've seen they have a lot of individual talent and skill in their hands. Yadron, for example, the guy who solo killed Magi Felix. And then you go down the bolt lane, you have Nightmares, who, yes, so far he has been playing a little bit of a babysit support, but I just want to see him a little bit more active in the map together with Flipper. Now, I know this is not necessarily a mid lane meta, but at this point in the ERLs, you can shine with your own game style. And right now, Yadron for me is the star player of the team. You can play towards him, you can get him ahead and then snowball into other lanes. As I find Dreedy a very stable sort of top lane, he can play pretty much anything. He can play the engage, he can play the, the tank, he can play the weak side. So you've got everything you need right there. Put uh, Devoxne in an Ezreal or something that can sit underneath the tower to farm and then just roam around the map, get the other one ahead. GG. Yeah, I mean, it sounds easy when you put it like easy that, right? Paper, right? <laughs> <laughs> but let's be honest, when, when Yadrin got that solo kill too and, and Mashi Felix, it was a mistake coming in from Mashi Felix too. Don't do that! And it, okay, 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 I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to go down that path. I'm going to take another path then. Um, I think that Nightmares and then Voxner has been extremely underwhelming, I'll be honest. I, I thought there was a lot of hype coming around Nightmares into this NLC roster and he just hasn't delivered let, uh, yet. The same thing could be said for for Monster Rugby Gaming, I thought that Unforgiving showed a good first game against Eminem. Granted, that was Eminem, but against Fnatic, they seemed to be struggling. But what Monster Rugby Gaming did have was a lot of nice ideas. We did see them with a five man in wait, some creative points here, but they're just completely shut down by Fnatic, which is besides the point. Point is, they have ideas, they're willing to execute them, and they have a lot of preparation. I think going into Barrage, they are one of the more predictable teams. Granted, that they are playing through a consistent mid laner in Yatran, and I think that he's going to have a hard time against Sepix, who I think have been extremely consistent too. I think actually I want to expand on that point and I'm going to go even more uh, definitive. I think every single player on Monster Rebel Gaming outclasses in, in every role. I th I genuinely feel that way. And especially... Spicy! In the, I like that. I, I, especially in the bot lane. Unforgiven and Heaver, I think, are potentially the best bot lane in our entire tournament. Uh, Heaver's probably the best support that we have in the NLC as well. That's... That's genuinely my feeling here. I, I, I know it's spicy, but that's how I feel. So if I just may interject here then, what, okay, let's say you're after draft. Do you feel that this is a type of matchup that after you see draft that you'd be able to 100% be like, this team has won? Uh, I look, Possibly. I look, my opinion <laughs> holds less weight than <laughs> than everybody else's on the desk. <laughs> so, but uh, yes, yeah. I, I, I think, believe that Barrage can really shine on specific champions, right? Uh, give Thresh to Nightmares, allow him to roam around the map, get Yadron on one of his champions. He can play the Gassin, he can play the Vladimir, he can pick out a spicy Choga from the mid lane, get these three, one of these three champions that he has in his hands into a very strong point where he can carry into the lake. I and mean, I feel like you have a way through, but 
Monster Rugby Gaming on paper, of course, they are the favourites right here. And of course, um, I hold a special place in my heart for Sebex because she does play Zoe and I really like Zoe. I mean, I'm going to go against you there. Don't I don't like Sepix because he's playing Zoe, maybe for other reasons. But, <laughs> I mean, coming into this, you're asking, is it going to be determined by draft? And then we can 100% say this team is going to win no matter what. I think that's kind of hard going into that. We don't necessarily know what they're going for. We have seen them be extremely favored toward the Callista and unforgiving in the early game. Granted that he is a good player, but he did look extremely shady or shaky on his Callista performance against Fnatic. Granted, he did play against the Varus. As a Callista, and it was not a good time because Varus got a kill in the early game. But I, I do believe. Oh, Go no, on. continue. I, I guess right. I just mean the sentiment of, um, you know, like Trouble's listing off all of these like comfort picks or these pocket picks that these guys have. Do they need to get the pocket picks? Like, is it a champion pool issue? Can you say after a draft that if I see one of those pocket picks, you're like, yes, this team has absolutely won? Or if this is both 5v5 team fight drafts, can you be like, yes, this team has won because they are the better 5v5? I don't think Sebex is bad enough to let a Cassadin go unpunished. Like I, I just think I just I just think Cassadin, you're playing a caster minion for like three, four, you know, more like six, seven minutes in the game, right? So maybe even longer. So I, I just feel like I feel like yes, these pocket picks can work out, but I, I just feel like Monster Ruby Gaming might be too good to let that slip. And the point here is that we haven't necessarily seen Barrage have an easy way through. You know, they, they, they've played against Fnatic and so, so it's a really hard opponent to ease yourself into the tournament. So going in versus Monster Rugby Gaming, also not going to be the easiest because we did favor them as the second best team in this group uh, after Fnatic, uh, before all the <clears throat> trick situation happened. But I feel like they do they do have a chance if, if they get the good draft. I don't necessarily think that the players are only good on these pocket picks, but they do shine with the way they play if they do get them. Now, the question is going to be, is Monster going to respect the pocket picks and bun them out? And if they do, are they going to leave some very juicy ones that are S tier right now? How much pie am I going to have on my face if uh, if Barrage end up winning this? That's, that's, that's all I'm going to say. Right, we're going to go to a quick break. When we're back, we're diving into picks and bands. See you then.
Was that strange face staring at me in the mirror, in the mirror? What's this strange change, change of season coming over, coming We we'll let the spikes cool off just a little bit here as we get into the draft. Let's uh, let's go in with an even slate. Let's see exactly where Monster Rugby Gaming go. A Callista Band. That's uh, not surprising. I know that Unforgiven and Heaver are both uh, quite early game lane dominant uh, players, so they are going to have that taken off immediately. It tells me then that if the standard red side bands are going to be like the Syndra, the Varus, and now Callista's taken away um, and now set, that the first pick's probably going to be a jungler, either Trundle or Graves. There's also the chance that the Aphelios is high priority if they feel like the uh, ADC pool is pinched too hard, but I assume it'll be a handshake between Aphelios, Lulu, and Ezreal Karma. So I think that this is going to be already indicative of like Callista being banned on blue side, that it'll be like a Trundle or Graves priority. Maybe even the Twisted Fate blind, since it seems that people really like it here. And honestly, I feel like if it is that handshake that you talk about, and then Barrage are able to grab the Aphelios Lulu, it's good to have Heva on Karma. Heva is like a huge playmaker, and if he does end up being on the sort of press E sort of support, I think it's going to be a better case for Barrage. Okay, Karma's still up and available here too. Um, and Israel, and Aphelios, and Lulu, like all of these picks we're talking about. So not that many high tier priority coming out, and the same goes for Yatra, and he also uh, is able to contain all of his champion pool so far. It is really deadly to blind pick that on blue side though. And uh, we're just seeing Dreedy hover vein. He had a Dreedy uh, vein highlights years ago, months ago on that champion, but yeah, it is gonna be the Aphelios instead. But I think it's really easy to rotate Trundle Ezreal here, um, which unless these junglers just don't play the, the Trundle, maybe they have more of a preference for a Grave. Mm -hmm. I feel like Trundle really causes a lot of problems for Aphelios. One of the issues though is that Trundle Ezreal Yumi isn't the best uh, 3v3 in terms of like making action happen into the bot lane. And so by doing the Trundle, like while in the team fights can cause Aphelios a lot of problems in terms of the lane pressure. Okay, yeah, I like that a lot more. In terms of the lane pressure, he's not gonna have to gank it more, but if that's a Volibear jungle, you're gonna be moving very quick and you're gonna cause a a lot of uh, zoning issues for that Aphelios in team fights. Especially if you're not going for the Lulu here either, then you got Volibear with the Yumi if you want to go for the Sumis uh, with the big <laughs> slappy bear there. But instead, you also have the opportunity of Karma. So now you've just opened yourself up for more possibilities after seeing the first three picks coming in from Barrage. And the same can be said for Barrage. They actually feel forced to yeah. take away the Karma here just because they don't want to deal with that Ezreal Karma. What you oh. think of trouble? <laughs> oh, I don't like it at all. I wish they had just forced Heva to go onto the Karma so he's not being a big nuisance in the rest of the map and we already have Maxlo on the Volbe who's going to be sitting in front of that uh, Aphelios and not allowing him to move anywhere near uh, the rest of his team and now with the Karma there I was about to say well okay maybe we can see a flex but the Orianna is instantly getting locked in now that is another pick that Yadron is really good at and he's playing a lot so apart from the Vladimir's the the Cassadins and the Cholgats who are not necessarily the S tier picks right now I love that I'm seeing a reckless comp on Barrage so far. And all I'm waiting to see is something that will put the ball into the enemy team. You have to somehow reach the back line. So the first thing that I'm thinking about right here is maybe a Wukong for the top lane. You can either go for the dive. I agree that that might be the options. They need to figure out some way to deal with the Aphelios and Fnatic and the LEC usually go for um, the Wukongs, the, the Gangplanks, the um, Zax, something that immediately gets back there. I think we should see a ban or a pinch on Azir. It makes sense to me that you're gonna go for long range uh, mid lane matchups here. And I think that there's still the advantage that if 
The Ezreal comp does get the Azir that they can play at arm's length. So I think the Zoe makes sense there. Another really long weight range champion so that you can play with your range advantage. Like right now you've great zone control for Aphelios. You know, the Orianna ball, the uh, Karma protections as well as zone. The thing is, is Aphelios is actually relatively low range if he doesn't have access to his sniper rifle. And so you need champions to empower him that he can actually walk front to back into team fights. And he's got two good ones, but I think an Azir would really ruin his day if they don't ban that and let it through. Yeah, we're going to take a look at that uh, ban coming through in a second, but I just want to touch about Barrage here, because they are actually breaking pattern here in the way they've been playing. First week, we saw them go on to the Cassidy and play for Yatra in there. Second week, where it was still about him on the on the Vega too. And now it's actually about the Vox thing here on this Aphelios, where you're playing with the Karma, you're playing with the Orianna, which is Yatra's default back to Control Mages too, which, so he's still comfortable on it. But it's really interesting to see that we're seeing three different variations of a Barrage roster on three weeks here. Yeah, and actually, um, sorry, Trouble, I was just going to mention okay. that um, uh, that Devox, Devox thing, when you look at his past performances, that's an that's Annie, oh my god. That's I'll, I'm, I, We're going to go into that in just a second, because that's a big pick, but uh, if you look at Devox thing in the past, <laughs> Aphelios was his best performing champion when he's been in in, in competitive. He's always inc been incredibly good at Aphelios. He's a very positional kind of mechanic based AD carry. But Annie, I need to I need to <laughs> let this one let this We're one over. Annie gets oh kicked. my god, it's all coming out here. <laughs> I love this draft so fine. I actually think that, sorry for interrupting you here, but I actually think that, first off, Sephix, almost any one trick poly temporary elo in solo queue, and she was banned last week in competitive, and she's now allowed in this patch. So that's obviously why they go for that blind pick. But they are just going straight for that protect the AD carry composition here. With the, with the Ivrune coming in here too. And you're actually going for some classic 3D side lane carry potential here with oh the Camille no. too, who works fine with this. And we're seeing the Lee Sin last pick coming here. You don't seem happy about it. Uh, Cause it's just, you have to play 2v2. Like the idea is point and click Annie stun into Lisa and hopefully you pop someone with like a balloon. I feel like Munster's comp is like, they just have to brute force and be better players. Cause I think the win condition and the opportunities that they have are much smaller than what I'm looking at the left side of your screen. I look at the left side of your screen. I'm like, you can play at any point in that game. Your team fights are disgusting. Your scaling is incredible. Your one four is amazing. So I feel like Munster rugby, like really narrow win conditions to execute on. And this is also going to reply to your question, right? You you were like, whoever has the easier execution comp, uh, are they going to win? Whoever has more scaling, whoever technically wins draft, are they going to win? Is that what we're going to see? So I think this one is going to reply to your question uh, in terms of how is it going to pan out in game? Because I do like the Barrage um, draft here as well. I love the Ivan. There's so much protection for that Aphelios, but there's also so much protection for the Camille who's diving into the backline, playing bold delivery. We talked about how you cannot pin down that Ezra. Well, Camille can. Goodness me, that was a spicy draft. Uh, to, to spicy, <laughs> spicy discussion into spicy draft. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let this one cool off. I'm going to hand it over to our casters, uh, Hip Rain and Orcs. Take it away. Thank you very much, Excoundrel. Hello and welcome back to the Caster Desk because we're getting ready to go into game number two. It's Barrage taking on Monster Rugby Gaming. Now, Orcs, we have an Annie to talk about. We will get on to that, Annie. But let's talk a little bit about the past two weeks for these teams. Barrage are currently 0-2, while Monster are 1-1. One and one. Everyone was predicting Munster to be one of our top two teams in the league, but I want to talk about the teams they've played up versus and their performances there because Barrage, while they're 0-2, they played versus Tricked and Fnatic, our two strongest teams, the two undefeated teams in Group A, while Munster, they lost to Fnatic and their only win so far is versus m, &M. So for them, this is a statement game for them to say, no, we are strong, we only lost to Fnatic. And for Barrage, they challenged Fnatic in week one. If you remember, Yadrin on that uh, Cassidin actually was popping Fnatic. So I'm actually really excited to see how strong Barrage actually are here. Yeah, and I think this really sets the tone for both of these teams in the group. Like Munster, they, they lost to Fnatic, but Fnatic are looking insanely good. We saw that last game and they beat Eminem, but the, the inherent rule is everyone beats Eminem. So ultimately we're at a point now where it's hard to place these teams. And on paper, I think everyone would agree that Munster is heavily favored, but this is really going to be the test where we'll get to see, can Braj do what they've been doing, play these scaling picks and lean into the later stages, or will Munster be able to find some headway? And 
We've seen a little bit of a different identity for Munster. The Callista ban, a big factor in that. Unforgiven has been leaning heavily on the Callista with playmakers for Heaver. This is a very different sort of story here with the Ezreal Yumi. Generally not going to be as much of an impact in the early levels. And Heaver's playmaking, Heaver's roaming is essentially disabled on the Yumi. So I'm actually a little bit concerned for Munster here because to me, Barrage are doing what Barrage do uh, best which has those scaling aspects, but also they have picks like the Karma into the Yumi, which are going to be able to apply pressure early. Whereas for Munster, it's like they have a divide. They wanted to pick up the Ezreal Yumi for its strength, but at the same time, they felt, no, we want some agency. We can't go to late game against three Shield Champs and Aphelios. And so they picked up this Annie and this Lee Sin, and really it's going to be very much about them. We need to see Sebex and uh, Max Law challenging in that mid jungle and trying to apply the pressure to the side lanes. I also think top lane potentially a good option with Shikari and the Volley Bear, but ultimately the agency and sort of the, the onus is on Munster to be setting the pace of this game. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, you know, Shikari is kind of known as a bit of a brick wall top laner. I think that's fair to say. Um, doesn't really lose to too many people. He's very good at absorbing pressure. Uh, on this Volley Bear versus uh, Dreedy on the Camille. What are you making of this? Well, like, I think if this work. In this situation, you need to be applying more pressure. I mean, up against a Camille, you want to be bowling her out in the early levels. Volley does have good all-in in the extended trades. And ultimately, there shouldn't be a situation where Dreedy is able to get off the second precision protocol because you should be looking to stack up that bite, get the heal yourself and the increased damage. So I want to see Shikari being more than a brick wall. This is something he's been criticized for in the past, is that as much as is a great weak side player, which has its place, when he's in a situation where he needs to punish the matchup, sometimes he isn't as aggressive as he could be. So hopefully in this game, we get to see a bit more of that aggression from him. What's your favorite song from Annie Orcs? My favorite you know, song? The musical? Yeah, the musical. Oh, uh, it's a hard knock life. I think it's a no brainer. <laughs> there it is. I was trying I to remember the only one I could think of was Tomorrow. I especially I love the Division Austin Powers. Tell me if you that one. <laughs> that is such a good film. <laughs> oh, man. I was in Annie actually once. I played the Apple Seller. Are you not telling the, me like not the film that, that I was in a play of Annie? Was this like a play at your school? Was this like no, no? It was part of an am amateur dramatics group. Ooh, fair enough. Well, I uh... used to have an acting agent. I wasn't a good actor. So I don't know why they were my agent. <laughs> <laughs> Maxwell's found Flipper here. Has got that shield on him, and he has a tower nearby. But Maxwell is gonna be able to kind of bully Flipper out of the jungle a little bit. There are no camps though for him to really go for anywhere apart from the opposite side of the map so we'll give him uh control of the crab you also saw that sebex moved up so this is pretty much guaranteed for maxwell this top lane crab yeah so they get the crab which is nice but ultimately the thing is invades are so punishing against an Ivern because typically you set up the camp you leave it you come back to it you've already invested the time the hp and, and importantly the pathing to set that camp up so if someone steals it away it really is a big hit to an Ivern. Obviously, he's good at invading as well with the smite being able to instant secure a camp. But ultimately, Maxwell tries to make that punish, but Ooh, doesn't find that. They're looking for it. They've gone for the flash. They've got the kick. Yajun has to flash underneath the tower. Flipper comes in, misses out on the tether. He's going to start to plant those bushes out, though. And it looks like Munster, they went for the play. They burn the flash. They get a flash in response. But overall, nothing really gained. Yeah, I mean, it's trading summoners, but I will say that does favor the side of Munster because obviously their goal is to threaten this Orianna. You have point and click CC. Lee Sin loves that. It's really easy for him to follow up. So we are looking for this, the flash timer off Orianna. We are looking for a return gank on Max Law, and that's when we're going to see the payoff from that first gank. Yeah, do you, you see uh, Flipper hung around just to shove the lane in as well to make sure Yadrin could go for a reset? He has his teleport available to him. Looks like it was a, tra a trade out of the crabs. Maxwell got top lane while Flipper got bot lane. And that, that just needs to be the goal there for Flipper Ooh. ultimately. It's just facilitating your lanes. Wow. Shikari doing a lot of damage there to Dreedy. Dreedy is able to get away, but with the passive and the electrical bite, Shikari will be able to shove this lane in. Dreedy does have a teleport, so he can just come back to lane if he needs to. And it looks like he will. He's down pretty heavily in the CS department as well. 40 to 26 right now. Yeah, very rough in that situation to leave the wave. So going to TP back up. Now the question is going to be, what does uh, Shikari do in this situation? I think it'll be telling what the game plan is for Munster. 
and he's opting to walk back to lane. So you could see him TP top to continually ap apply pressure to Dreedy, keep him down. But this suggests to me that he's looking to play more for his team on the map. They now have that TP advantage. Watch out for Max Law here. Yadrin's looking to chase him down. Can Flipper land the snare? Everybody roamed up from the side of Barrage there. Denvoxny and Nightmares making their way over. They thought about starting up that dragon. They decided the better of it. Yeah, I think well, the chase on, chase on Max Lox, he gave up a lot of the priority, so they'd pushed the wave in bot. Um, but obviously, that time that they, they had an advantage on over Unforgiven and Heaver was kind of sacrificed. And now, if you actually look towards bot lane, we can see Unforgiven's managed to freeze the wave here. Heaver's even gotten off a free recall in this situation where the wave is kept here. So this is working out really well for uh, Munster's bot lane. And as much as we said, there's a lot of scaling on Barrage, the Ezreal Yumi are the catalyst for Munster's late game. If they start to snowball early, they can really be a threat to the side of Barrage. Max Law will be able to pick up this Cloud Drake. He's taking a lot of damage, but with the Spell Vamp on his shield, he should be fine. Cheeky Invade coming out from Flipper though, making sure he can secure these Raptors. Does have that smite, so he will get the camp for a minute. I thought he wasn't going to smite that there. Then Voxney, with the flamethrower, is able to actually shove out this lane and break the freeze, though. So, with no support available to Unforgiven, he does have to be a little bit careful here. Then Voxney is going to be able to shove in. I don't think they're going to be able to pick a plate up, though. Yeah, the wave thinned out a little bit too much, and ultimately, no play goes down. They managed to get the early dragon, which is important. Something we hi highlighted in the previous game was when you're the team who wants to be more aggressive, who wants to start to snowball the game, getting the early dragons is really important because every single one the enemy gets essentially delays your soul by five minutes. So Munster on that time are pretty early and could potentially threaten it as a win condition when Ezreal really is at his, as, at his strongest as a champion. Sebex, no flash available, does have that Tibbers, but meanwhile in the top lane, Dreedy getting jumped onto Shikari. Uses the Stormbreaker to jump underneath tower and actually takes a little bit too many tower shots, so he will be sent packing. And now, members are rotating up. Flipper's here to make sure Dreedy can shove the lane out. Shikari's ultimate time's out. Three members of Munster, though, are on this top side of the map, and Dreedy has to be very, very careful as Maxmore and Sebex looking for it. Tibbers has actually been summoned, so they have something to tank the tower with for a little bit. They're getting a teleport in. Dreedy now looking to see if he can get away. Goes for the hook shot, gets stunned up by the Q. They actually do look onto Maxwell here. As the first one's picked up by Sevix. The tower shots are coming down, and that is Maxwell sliding in for a second. A very, very clean dive by Monster in the top side. Yeah, really good use of the Tibbers there to start the tank up off the tower. And Flipper just wasn't able to do much. The point and click stun from the Annie, and very good aggro sharing. You saw Sevix got it first. And it was Raj focused in Max Law, but he never actually took tower aggro. It went from Sebex, then to Shikari, and it meant they were able to pick up those two kills. I was saying how the teleport indicated Munster would use it for a play. Not going towards bot lane, though, they decided just to apply more pressure top. Obviously, with the Ezreal Yumi, not too much playmaking potential within that lane, at least before the Yumi's level 6. But really nice from Munster there. Then does the have, have the I'll kill you combo on his guns right now. But let's have a little look at that dive once again, because it was just really clean by Munster. So notice that Sevex goes for the first stun, which is point and click. Tanks aggro for three hits, and then Maxwell moves away because he's low HP. Shikari picks up aggro next. It's just very nice balancing, and there wasn't really a good target for Barrage to try and focus down, because as much as Maxwell was close to them, he never took the tower aggro. So nice coordination, always good to see. All right, well, Munster now with their bot, with their jungle, sorry, back on the map towards the bot side. They feel a little bit more comfortable to step up. Nightmares also starting to run, run, run a little low in the old mana department. I mean, so is Unforgiven in this situation. True. Remember, this is actually after the changes to Yumi uh, on 10.13, where the mana cost does end up ramping up quite a bit because it becomes a percentage of your max mana. So things like Mana Flow Band and Presence of Mind, which are common options, actually hurt you in the long Wait, run. Wait, has Flash, he has Tibbers, Maxlaw lands the kick. Yajun is able to jump away, the Shockwave connects onto Maxlaw as he takes a couple of tower shots. Tibbers tanking for the moment as Yadrin gets himself the kill onto Maxlaw. Great turnaround by Barrage there. Yeah, absolutely good response. Flipper right there to turn it around. True shot. Kill comes in as well, so wouldn't have gotten him, but... I'm just going to say, I think it's a little bit sloppy there. We talked about the flash timer on Jadron, how I'd be looking at the return gank for it to punish. When the next time you gank after being in a flash is once it's back up, 
you're really just wasting that first gank. And this one ends up going badly because Jadron had his summoner available. Ultimately, I would like to see Max Law maybe come over a wall, find a kick on a Jadron, then have the follow-up. But this was a bit forced. Jadron had the summoner and Munster ended up paying for it. All right, well, the bases look to be coming through for Jadron. He's got himself that tier, so he's going for a little bit more of the scaly build. Actually, just decided like to cancel it. He was waiting in the wings. Devex doesn't have Tibbers available. It looks like the rotation for Monster is to start out onto this. Rift Herald, although they don't actually have their bot lane down here. Unforgiven decided to stay bot lane and just kind of farm up on the well, Ezreal. They, they have the Yumi, and Dridi's TP isn't quite available yet. So if they did start the Elder on that timer, they would have had a numbers, well, equal numbers. But right now, the Volleyball is a lot more valuable than level, level 7 Ezreal. Ultimately, though, they've waited a bit of time. So Dridi's teleport coming up. And as a result, Unforgiven is going to run up towards the top side, so they have equal numbers. But for now, Shikari's found an angle. They're looking for a gang. Oh, they do have that angle. Now Den's going to get stunned up, slowed down, exhausted. The final chapter gets used. This Den Voxy can't kite for long. He will get taken down. And Nightmares as well being chased onto. Flipper is able to find a little bit something extra here. Shikari takes a couple of tower shots. Look, Devex is making his way forward. That's going to be the true shot for us. Devex has Tibbers. The shields are on. The teleport's getting used. Tibbers is summoned. Flipper gets the shield off onto himself as Maxwell chasing forward able to find himself the kill shikari now coming in but here's yandrin on that flank he has that shockwave keep it in mind he gets stunned up instantly by sevex shockwave lands onto two and that's going to be a nice and easy turnaround here for barrage they're looking to hunt for a little bit more kick lands onto yandrin he has the shield that's going to be the double kill dreedy jumps over the wall and secures another one barrage have just turned this play on its head as monster have been chased back towards their own base there is nowhere to go for shikari as dreedy finds a double kill an over four situation by Munster, and they end up getting punished heavily. Unforgiven, not even there to join in the fight, but the rest of the team get cleaned up. And this is really bad, actually, for Munster. They're one scaling element, not even partaking in that fight. And the rest of the team, champions like Annie and Lee Sin, where you want to have that early aggression, getting punished. 3-0 now, Noriana. 2-1 and 2 in the Camille. And a dragon about to be picked up by Barrage. This is disastrous for Munster. Well, Munster still want to try and contest it a little bit here. Maxwell has found Flipper isolated from the team, but they look to turn this around as Heaver gets caught out by the Graviton. Oh, no. I think he'd be able to jump back onto a target to live as the Redemption heals the Barrage members back up. And now, Munster do have that inside track onto the mid lane. You can see they're rotating a couple of members over. Looks like Maxwell maybe just wants to go for the Herald, though. Yeah, might be able to sneak this one up away, but resets are coming in from Braj, and we do have the replay here, and you can see the initial play, it's actually pretty slow. They don't land the final chapter onto Denvoxley early, and Maxwell's very split in the focus, looking for two kills. He gets chunked out, and then Sebex comes in with the engage, but critically, there's a TP from Dreedy, and we talked about that before. His TP had come off a timer, Unforgiven was walking up, and that means there was a numbers advantage, even more so when you factor in the tower, and it's just like Munster are trapped right now. They're trapped between two towers. They're trapped between the jungle where the Orianna is threatening. And ultimately, it's a very nice cleanup from Barrage. Very restrained play. They know that Munster are the ones being pressured by the towers around them. And they can just take it slow. Well, as you can see in the replay, the Rift Herald was picked up by Max Law. He's going to summon it mid lane as well. It's not actually low enough to die from this Herald, so often we do see mid tower being so important, just getting a low is a big factor, but <laughs> oh, he's actually, actually, actually so That big. was actually such a smart play there. Summon up the minion to make sure they get the Herald in. It's, it's completely <laughs> wasted. Oh, that's so big brain from Flipper. Just throwing down Daisy there. And complete, I mean, he's just completely wasted that Herald. That was the one consolation prize Munster had from that turn of play. And it didn't even get its charge off. Barrage just doing wonders here. I like that this is kind of a 6 6 game as well, when you've got the Tibbers and Daisy. Yeah. I mean, it's like a Pokemon battle, right? Yeah. One's Fire-type, one's Grass-type. So Cervix technically wins then. And yet... What we're seeing is a little bit different. Gold lead, <laughs> very slightly in favor of the Salad Raj. But you got to think about the scaling elements of their composition. It does make me start to get a little bit worried about Munster. Unforgiven really needs to be a big force for this team if they're going to be able to carry this out later. But for now, Team Raj push up towards the bot lane. Plating has dropped. And for the champions, 
Phileos very good at taking this down. Oh, now, there is a there's behind. a teleport coming, coming in. in. They do get themselves the turret, but Barrage is on them to run. Sebex is chasing in forward. He has the flash. He has the Tibbers. He has the stun. Goes in with a protobell. Misses the Tibbers. Fantastic flash by Denvox. Need to get away. Meanwhile, in the top lane, Dreedy's going for a fight here with Shikari. Dreedy actually is starting to lose out a little bit here. Goes in for the taunt. Flipper gets the redemption off. And Shikari actually just has to ult away. Doesn't want to stick around. Yeah, managed to get out of the 1v1, so Shikari trying to pressure Dreedy there, and the response comes in from Flipper, but ultimately doesn't amount to him going down. But yeah, I mean, TP in from Sebex. It does mean they burn the flash from Denvoxne, so that's something they can punish in the future. Sebex still has his flash available, but we saw that before. We saw Jadron lose his flash, and it just didn't amount to anything. I want Munster be to be playing around these timers, if you blow up these squishy backliners, that's where the win condition is in these team fights. But if you just let them wait out their flash cooldown, it really won't amount to much. And we really are seeing this kind of power balance you're talking about where it was hard to place where Barrage actually fell in this group because they their first three games have been versus three very, very strong teams in the league that were in their group as well. And I mean, they challenge Fnatic. They're currently doing a really, really stellar job to kind of challenge versus Munster. I mean, it's Overall, just, just really good showing here for Barrage and maybe a little worrying for Munster. Yeah, I think it's worrying for Munster and I don't just mean in terms of what this means to them as a team, but also just this game right now because it's definitely not over by any means, but you have not hit those early game win conditions. To have the likes of Noriana so strong already and to be dealing with an Aphelios with so much protection, it's where things start to get tense. And we saw that last game from Dusty, when things start to get tense, when you feel like the game's on a timer, you end up over forcing, and it's very easy for the other team just to respond, and it ends up backfiring massively. Right now, Raj looking to play around mid, set up some priority to that dragon spawning in 30 seconds. So this could be a chance for Munster to get a big Annie ult off, then Voxne has no flash, and that could be an important factor here. Can see the vision was toggled there as Dreedy actually jumps away from Sebex. Sebex now has used Tibbers, which is key here. Maxlaw slides in, gets the kick off onto Yadrin. Yadrin has the redemption on, goes for the shockwave. Does catch a couple of members, but he is out of there. Shut down for Sebex. Flippers stunned up. The shield on him is going to go down as a massive moonlight visual by Denvoxny, but he is flashless. He doesn't have the damage to stick. And down goes the AD carry and mid laner. The carries are dead. And Munster send Barrage packing. Dreedy now. Taking a fight with Shikari, but Shikari does have nightmares and flippers at his back, so Shikari has to be a little careful. Yeah, they'll get the dragon in this situation. It was just a good punish coming out from Munster. They went at a fast pace. They had the engage potential and a very nice flank from Manx Law just to set up Jadrin and punish him. I was scared about this Oriana, and they almost instantly managed to take it out. So good moves from them. And uh put a little less worry in this game. Well, at least for their side. Raj now 3,000 goal behind and Hand on that dragon. Something to note as well is that we saw that massive ult from Zen Voxney. Uh, the Moonlight Vigil got nerfed. The follow up water attack, the crit rate uh, ratio has been nerfed from 50% to 20%. So that could have been a lot more significant if we saw that on patch 10 12 and not 10 13. It was a big hole, but yeah, like you said, not really enough there. Zen Voxney obviously is just running around with just the Infinity Edge, however, so he's not. Really, really in a massive power spike at the moment. Unforgiven. Got the mirror mana. Building towards his Triforce now. So that's that kind of big two item spike for the Ezreal. I mean, we were talking as well about how the engage from Annie will be a critical factor. And I mean, look at the items. Spellbinder, Protobelt. The focus here is getting in range of these squishy backliners. And as much as we're talking about the scaling elements of Raj, I feel like. If your backline isn't able, if you're not able to protect them, they'll always Oh, Sebex just flashes Tibbers and oh, 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 oh by Denvoxney. I was talking about backline protection. Uh, not any there, and Sebex able just 100 to 0 the AD carry. And this is where the concern comes in the later stages for Barrage. If they end up playing sloppy, if the backline ends up being out of position, they can just be punished in the situation. Eventually, the shields might become too much, but for now. Greedy going for a fight here, uses the Hextech ultimatum to pull Shikari, and Shikari tries to jump away with his ultimate, they do have that Blast Cone available. Greedy hook shots over the wall, gets himself the kill. The Precision Protocol, but they will lose the turret in the mid lane, however. And Zebex pushing up in that bot side as well. 
a lot burnt there for Barrage, and all they did was kill the Volley Bear. Yeah, so getting a kill on the board is nice, but they lose that mid tower. And now Ezreal, Yumi doing the thing that they do best. It's just sitting mid, constantly harassing, very hard to threaten. If you do try and engage on them, they will have that uh, lost, that final chapter, sorry, just to disengage in the mobility of the Ezreal. And something to factor in is that there isn't too much engage on this composition. Really, you're relying on a Camille flank. And without ultimate, there's not as much you can do. So it's just spent a time pushing up the bot wave, but ultimately it just means that Sebex is unchecked here, Unforgiven and Heave are unchecked, and they're in a comfortable spot. They really are, and Unforgiven now with the stacked mirror mana, probably close to the Triforce, will really start to put in some damage now. All right, well, 20 minutes on the clock. It's a 2,000 gold lead over to Munster at the moment. They've got two dragons. The word denied one by Barrage. Barrage actually looking to try and hold this wave bot lane, get Denvox near some time to farm. Going for the freeze, which uh, I think I think is the right call in the situation. You're confident in your late game scaling elements. Essentially, the goal for Barrage is you go into a team fight. Aphelios has multiple items, including the death stance. And when you, they try and engage in him, he has 2000 HP with the shields. That is what you're looking for. So stalling out, uh, freezing in the side wave, absolutely the right call. And right now, there isn't really anything for Munster to do. Dragon's not spawning for a minute and a half. Baron isn't really on the cards right now. They are going to set up vision on the bot side, potentially threaten a pick. But ultimately, Raj don't have to face check into this, not for another minute at least. So Vex is waiting around. He does have that proto belt, goes in for the tip. It's the final chapter's there. Yadrin! Unable to do anything. He summons the Sombrero, but it's not going to kill anyone. Now, Dreedy, we're going to see if he can come over that wall. They've got Daisy getting a free man knock up. In goes Dreedy, trying to find something onto Heaver, but there's still four members of Munster, and they're all so, so healthy. Tibbers will get pulled back as well. They save the tier two, but they lose their mid lane. And look at Shikari in the bot side, just shoving in hard. If you take a look at the vision, for Barrage, it's all on that top side of the map. It's nowhere near this dragon. Flipper looking for something onto Unforgiven. The tower will go down, and they do actually catch him out with the tether. Denvoxny's chasing up. Has got himself a fair amount of movement speed. They do go forward for the flash, and that's a shutdown for Denvoxny. Oh, making so a big. double kill. That is big. That was so greedy from Unforgiven. Staying there, just auto-attacking the tower when they're getting up in his face, and then doesn't flash the root at the end. A really nice punish from Barrage. They saw this Ezreal Yumi overstepping. And they end up getting a thousand gold into the pocket of Denvoxne there, thanks to the shutdown. So we were talking about the late game sort of fantasy for Barrage, the huge shields onto this Aphelios, and they just got a massive influx of gold to lean towards that. And now with Dragon coming up in eight, Unforgiven spawning at the same time, Barrage can just take this. Yeah, Dreedy is just going to catch this top wave as well. Has his teleport, same for Step X, but with the bushes as well, it makes it really, really hard for the side of Munster to actually step into this. This will be the second dragon over to the side of Barrage, and now a gold lead. One and a half gold, one and a half thousand, sorry, separating both of these teams. I think this has been a nice feature of Barrage, though, is that obviously they lean towards those scaling elements. We've seen that in the two previous games and in this one, but they're not afraid to challenge. You know, we saw from Jadron on the casting into Magi Felix's Twisted Fade. He sees an opportunity and he still goes for it, despite the fact they're a scaling team. They're not one just to sit back and do nothing. And we saw evidence of that there where they look to punish Unforgiven. And now, look at Denvoxny's items. He's got the Infinity Edge, he's got the Runans, and he's got the Ages. So that huge shielding that's going to be placed on him is getting increased effectiveness thanks to the resistances. And once he gets that Death Dance, I will once again be concerned for Munster because the mistakes they've had in this game have just slowed them down substantially. They've only got two dragons in their pocket. It's four minutes until the next one spawns. Baron isn't really a prospect right now. And as you can see from the gold graph, for, for the early sections of the game, it was very back and forth. Yeah, it's been really up and down here for the side of Munster, but it's still a tight game. I think Barrage are pretty happy with that. Like you said, they've got those scaling options, so... You know, the tighter they can keep this, the less they can give up, the better. We're 24 minutes onto the clock, and like you said, there's items coming in for Denvox. And the Unforgiven also building towards his own death stance. He has his Triforce. He's got his fully stacked mirror mana. So yeah, Adrian does need to be careful. He has been liable to getting jumped onto. Throws out the Shockwave onto Unforgiven. And that will be able to send him away. But Yadrin yeah, again, just... It's starting to be a little bit of a sore point. Now, if you have a look over on the bot side of the map, Dreedy 
That's a pretty big wave, and he's just shoving away. What Camille does best, kind of get into this later game, later state of the game, and just shove away, chip away at these towers. GD will make short work of towers if he's left alone. I mean, look at the damage he's done to that with one wave. Yeah, it gets really scary. Do you see Maxwell now coming for the flank? Dreedy's seen him on that ward. Yeah, Dreedy has the hook shot. Goes for the stun onto Maxlaw, gets kicked back, gets the slow, flashes away. The Stormbreaker gets used by Shikari, and he's going to use the Hextech Ultimation, trying to turn this around. Maxlaw is blocked away on the stun, and that's going to be the kill. Meanwhile, a team fight was breaking out bot side in the mid lane as a double kill gets picked up for Yadrin. Unforgiven now running to the winds as Yadrin's looking for a triple kill on the Oriana here. Unforgiven's able to distort over the wall and get out. That was close. But that was disastrous for Munster. I mean, they get Dreedy on the other side of the map, but he has Teleport up in 25. They have so much shielding to tank this Baron, and they have an Aphelios. It's not the best weapons for it, but they're just going to go for this. And I, I don't think there's anything Munster can do. You can see if Maxwell can get there in time. It is going down pretty quick, however. He's the sweeper. The, Maxwell, they he's even not aware? even interested. He's going for they his practice. Yeah, I mean, they've walked past that control ward. They must know what's happening, but clearly just said, we can't do anything. It's too I wanna risky. See, I want to see what happened on the top side, because I'm really confused why Sebex and Forgiven and Heaver were even in a position where they're within the realms of being picked, because you know your jungler's on the other side of the map. You know they're making it a play on the bot side. Why are you pushed up? And, and it ends up costing them so heavily. It is, it is a net loss. They got that kill bot side, but they still lost the turret. So Dreedy, even though he died, still got an objective for his team. Pulled the jungle away, chunked the jungle away, while the team were losing a team fight on the other side of the map, and it was just a Baron picked up a Barrage. Overall, just completely, completely oh well played by Barrage. Did you see that shielding onto yeah. the box? You know, I'm just saying, this is feeling pretty doomed right now. This is feeling like 200 years of pain for Munster. Oh my lord! Dreedy gets the kill! He's trying to jump away from the Tibbers and finds it! Dreedy! With the assassination off onto Sebex. Definitely a close one, but it's only gonna get worse for the Annie as the game goes on. Oh, Camille has a core items. Pick up a little bit more safety in the death stance likely next. As much as Shikari is getting some damage down here, as soon as Denvoxney walks open, walks over, you gotta be concerned. He has the trio behind him with all the shielding. I mean. Oh, oh my lord. I'm also thinking if Yadrin gets all those shields and puts a Sarah shield, he's got insane shielding. It's actually going to be so hard to cut through these Le members. League of shielding. I just remember ages ago, back when it was like Tristana hyper carry meta several seasons back, and there was like that picture of, I think it was Reckless on Tristana, and he had like his HP was tripled thanks to shield or something. I'm getting vibes from that sort of time, which is a little bit worrying, especially for Munster. Would well, you see the death stance picked up by both AD carries? Sebex has her Rabadons, but no penetration to deal with that extra magic resistant box they now has. A lot of core items completed, and this dragon spawn in two seconds. Raj moving over towards it, and Munster looking like they want to contest. This is sole point for whoever can get this dragon, and it looks like Munster, they're going to be way too slow here. Dragon is just melting. They want the fight, through. though. Shikari is on the flank, though. It looks like it's time for the team fight. Sebex has Tibbers. He's looking for his opening. Barrage got themselves caught out. They do get the stun onto Yadrin, but the shielding is just way too much. A two match shockwave comes down. The box is down. Shut down, picked up on the dead box. Dreedy looking for Unforgiven, trying to isolate him away from the team, but Munster's health bars are so, so low. They still find a double kill onto their Ezreal, though. Maxwell getting jumped onto. Yadrin going so, so low himself. Gets himself the slowest. Flipper puts the shield on. Maxlaw chasing Sevex as well. They do have that slow. They do have the damage to work with. Flipper running away. He's going to get the snare off, but Brunster will chase him down and take the kill. Soul point over the barrage, but the team fight for Munster. And it felt like they didn't care too much about the dragon. As much as it's important, that third one, they wanted the fight. You saw Barrage get corralled into that pit, and Munster just pincered them. They brought the Volley Bear in on one side, they had the Annie on the other, and they were just trapped. There wasn't much they could do, especially Denboxney and Jadron, both without flashes. It's a really nice team fight coming out from Munster. Let's have a little look at that fight once again, because it was... So the initial engage isn't actually that big. You see the ult from Tibbers, doesn't actually manage to take out the shielding on the Oriana, but a great kick from Maxlaw pushes them Voxney forwards, and all the shielding had just been used on Jadron, so the follow up was there. And then Drudy tries to single out the Ezreal, but he's a lot better on his own and obviously had Heaver with him, and they're able to turn it around. And 
kind of lucky actually that Braj able to stall the chase out afterwards so much with Flipper and Jadran because I actually think they might have been able to end the game if they got a very quick clean ace there. Yeah, it wasn't particularly the big Tibbers, but greedy. It had a purpose and the kick from Max Ball was really beautiful. Sebex. Looking for Dreedy. Dreedy's level 17 right now. Has himself a lot. Stevex looks to go in. They get the kick. They get the tibbers. And it's just Goodbye. 100 to 0. Bye bye, Dreedy. Yeah, well, we saw how close the 1v1 was before. With a little help, goes heavily into Stevex's favor there. Managed to kill that split push. And now they have pressure in all three lanes. And they're looking just to push up in this situation. And forgiven again, threatening this mid lane with the Yumi at, its, at his back. Inbox me has got the Infernum, so he's able to melt through these waves nice and quickly. It's Flipper. Final chapter's on to win. The redemption won't pop in time. Has two members down now for a fairly lengthy amount of time. And Barrage, lucky for them. Baron's not up for a minute. Because that could just be an easy Baron otherwise. Then Boxney's going to move to this bot side and just clear through this wave. It's Max Law sniffing for a pick onto Yadrin. The numbers advantage in a threat is enough to get the outer towers, but ultimately the wave clear. Then Boxney has Infernum and Runans, and Oriana as well. There's not really much they can do to actually break the base in this situation. But the critical thing is if you move up towards this blue side jungle, a lot of the vision has been swept out in this area. So resets now coming in for the side of Munster. And I want to see Braj just push into this area of the map and establish as much vision as possible because they need to get eyes on that Baron before it spawns 30 seconds. We actually see resets coming out from Jadron. So that massive area, that blue side of the map near the Baron for uh, for Barrage, there's no vision there. Now, there they is at least one... no vision for either team, at least. Well, very little vision for either team. They have that one control ward. But ultimately, they needed to get the vision down before Munster respawned. And now, as soon as Munster starts clearing out this control ward and clearing up some of the vision, they're just going to have nothing in that area. And I think a big thing with Barrage is not face checking, because that's where the danger is. If you step into the likes of an Annie Tibbers, that's where you're going to be concerned. So kind of a misplay there from Barrage, not to take the opportunity on the reset timing of Munster to push in and get that vision. Because they have none in the barren area and the river surrounding, Instead, their priority is to push up mid lane. They want to contest mid lane, force Unforgiven back, and then rotate over to that area. Although this does mean they are stalling out because Infernal Soul in 40 seconds could be the objective they're looking to play for. And as you see them lean towards the bot side of the map, I think that's been the call for them. They want the Soul less risky than the Baron. Yeah, you can see Dreedy also dealing with a pretty big wave here in the bot side, shoving it up. Shikari's committing for a tower himself, and they may just be trading out turret for turret here. The base has come through for Den Voxny. He's going to try and clear this wave in time, but Dreedy should just be able to take this tower as he's completely uncontested. Meanwhile, Shikari wasn't able to take the turret. Inhibitor getting started up by Dreedy here, and he should be able to pop this. This means the Baron, they'll have minions pushing it on the opposite side of the map. They may just trade this out for the Infernal Drake, but remember, this isn't Soul. Dreedy's continuing to push waves in. Now it's Yadrin. He has got that Shockwave. Stevex is looking for his ultimate, looking for his one shot. He gets Ooh. it through the shields. The Shockwave lands onto Maxor. It's too little. It's too late. And honestly, a bit of a misplay there from Barrage. They didn't check the brush. No exhaust use from Demboxne, and they end up getting blown up. And I actually like the play for Munster. Yes, they sacrifice the bot inhibitor, but Shikari forced them Voxnay to come back to base. The whole of Raj pulled towards their top lane inhibitor. And as a result, they managed to get that dragon. And now with the pick, they're going to be able to get this Baron as well. The bot lane inhibitor isn't too uh, consequential considering the objectives Munster was able to get. Dreedy shoves a wave in in the bot side just to make sure it crashes. But the reset's the Baron reset. So it's really quick for Munster to get back in and clear through those waves. So they're not going to lose anything there. So just overall. Really heads up play by Munster. They get a dragon and they get the Baron. This game has definitely been back and forth. And now you can just push through bot lanes. That inhibitor taken means essentially nothing. If Dreedy wants to be a split push threat, he's going to have to start again on the other side of the map. And as you said, with the enhanced recalls, it's really no issue for Shikari just to reset and handle the wave. He does not have TP, so that is one concern. And with that death stance finished, I'm a little... Actually, I say that. I was going to say I'm a little concerned about Sevex 1v1 potential. But he has now picked up the Void stuff, so I think that really makes his one-shot potential kind of hit its peak. 
Yeah, he's going to be incredibly strong right now. Almost full build. He's got that blasting one as his last component item in his pocket. Dream level 18 on the Camille. He's just going to hook shot over the wall and Barrage are actually just five man forcing in the mid lane. Kind of A-ramming it a little bit here. They are going to step away. I think that's the problem is that they've been splitting up so much. And ultimately, as much as Dreedy's happy in a side lane, then Voxne wants the support of his team. He wants everyone there to provide that shielding so the one shot doesn't manage to kill him off. And as well as that, he wants Dreedy there so they have an engage option if Unforgiven steps off. So that's why they're often feeling the pressure now to group up. Dreedy is resetting. He went towards the top side of the map, but they have to deal with this Baron wave here. And it's a big, big wave as well. Then Moxney, you can see this time playing very far away. Shikari's looking to jump in forward, just threatening for the moment. Daisy gets used. They've got a lot of bushes to hide in and use, but Drudy is on that flank here. He's going to get himself the hookshot onto one. Uses the ultimate onto Unforgiven for the moment. Stevek, watch him as Shikari launches into the team, just mincing through Barrage's health fast as the shockwave will land onto him. They die able to trade out here as Stevex is looking for his opening. Tibbers has already been used and it is down now. Yadrin doing so much damage, but Unforgiven as well. Now looking to chase onto, onto uh, Yadrin, but Yadrin is able to get away as the inhibitor turret will fall and the inhibitor in the bot lane. Barrage. Now left scratching. They need to just get back to base, reset, get the he heals up, and try and defend. The so four versus three right now, and Yadrin's already been chunked out. Tower number one will crumble as Max Law onto that flank, looking for Yadrin. Unforgiven just shifts into his face. The shield's fairly big as Yadrin is able to get away and survive. Yadrin's trying to heal up for the moment, but they're looking to run down Denvoxy, but Denvoxy has to flash away. He is healing through everything. The shockwave does land, but Stevex finds himself a double kill. Nightmares is just back way too late. The Nexus has been left open, and Monster will be taking the game. Oh, absolutely a close one then. Munster just bringing out the end. You see an Aphelios with so much shielding, you get towards the later stages of the game, and you gotta feel like Barrage would have that one in the bag, but ultimately, the coordination was better from Munster. They knew what they could give up, they knew what they needed to contest, and when it came to the team fights, they just never felt like they wanted to commit to Denvoxne unless they knew they would 100% kill him. In that last team fight, he had the Severum, he had the Crescendum, the sort of frontline shredder and the the one that you can just out heal anything the 200 years combo so they just didn't even approach him they killed what was close and they let the aphelios just be on his own so i think nice restraint from the side of monster in the later stages of the game the early game definitely sloppy though and i think yeah. as much as they got the win against Raj, it's a little bit concerning considering we have fanatic and tricked in this group yeah i for me Barrage is so heartbreaking for them because they've been playing really, really well in a lot of their games. It's just, they, they're they so close to like success and they're so close to greatness, but it's it's just like an inch too far for them and they, they're reaching, but they can't quite grab it. So we'll have to see how Barrage can turn this around. That does mean they do go 0-3. Now guys, we're going to cut to a quick break and when we're back, we'll let the analyst desk break that down a little bit more. So don't go anywhere. We'll see you in a second.
la 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 Yeah Your life hits hard But I hit right back I never back down I keep it on track It's the same day with no problems uh. I keep rising from the bottom Cause when the sun comes up And I look around Look, guys, I know I said that Monster were better pound for pound in every role, but in what world, in what world did Monster deserve to win that game? Like, I just don't know. <laughs> like, what? I'll eat my words because I thought Barrage had that one. But uh, look, Trouble, I, I know you're itching to get into this. Uh, in what world? <laughs> the barrage is always just... just so close to drink water from the fountain and they just trip on top of a stone right before they get there to put their hands in the water. This is unbelievable. I'm like so upset right now. <laughs> to reply to the, to the question that uh, Froskirin raised before uh, the picks and bands, it was like, in what world can we say that individually the entirety, you know, of Munster are out, um, are out skilling basically every single member on the side of Baraz? And if Baraz get on paper the the perfect draft can they still lose apparently they can because <laughs> even though she she literally said at like 10 minutes in maybe she was like there's no way barrage lose this unless they throw at the 17th minute what do you know straight away and it's just such a pain to watch such a great draft and then all the indecisions happening where they shouldn't be yeah, I, I think they need to play to the win conditions of their draft. I do think that the agency, of course, was going to be in uh, Annie and Lee Sin's hands, especially early on. What was funny, though, is because the Lee Sin-Annie combo mid lane never really broke the Orianna. You can see on your screen right now, Ori was actually able to change that one around. But I have never seen such a hard carry performance from an <laughs> Annie before. LS was right. Play this champion all the way to the, the ERL League because, like, Holy, this was amazing. His ability to play around uh, Fog of War to exert pressure on Barrage, and Barrage did not have a good vision game, which just like doubled down on top of it. This Annie, like, to me, single-handedly won the game. Big Annie play. Yeah, but, yeah, I can fully agree with that, because I don't know what the rest of Monster were doing. The play just before that, fully just combines that into the, they're just greedy. Honestly, I don't know what the laners and bot lane are doing over from the side of Munster. They're just playing like they're with full item and are able to run them down whenever. And that's just what, in consequence of that, made them go into a game that took way longer than it should have been. And yeah, in what world did they deserve to win that game? Apparently in this world, but it was not clean by any means whatsoever. And it felt like they were taking fights, yeah. they weren't taking in consideration, you know, the items of the, uh, the guns of the affiliates to have the proper combination there. They weren't taking in consideration of, oh, what are we actually fighting for? Are we fighting for soul or are we fighting for the third dragon? And then there were a lot of fights that were engaged by Barrage themselves when they actually had no reason to engage them on. We saw Munster make so many mistakes where they were splitting and Barrage were able to pick them off. You could keep on doing it over and over again and punish the mistakes instead they overforced themselves in fights that they didn't need to because in that case it felt like they were outscaling their opponents so you just have to wait until you hit this item key break points and then you force the fights and it didn't seem like it clicked with them i agree with everything you're saying trouble i'm really sorry i've got hiccups and i'm just getting wrecked by them so in this <laughs> analogy my hiccups are annie and i should be completely fine to do this segment but i'm just getting wrecked over and over <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, 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 let, I'll let you, I'll let you uh, chill on the hiccups there, Frost. Yeah, it was um, definitely an interesting game. Um, I've actually got Max Law ready for an interview, so I'm going to save you, Frost. I'm going to bring Max Law in. Um, and actually, I haven't spoken to Max Law in probably two or three years, so it's really nice to see you again. I uh, hope you're doing well, mate. Um, first of all, uh, this is actually more a personal question. How is it, was it like for you being back in competitive? Because it, obviously it's been a little while since you've been at a competitive level in League of Legends. How have you found getting back into that groove? Uh, it's been 
all, it's like it's like been uh, it's like kind of like uh, how I first started, where I just like started playing competitive and I'm like super excited and stuff like this, um, which is quite interesting because I haven't felt like this in a while. Um, so yeah, I'm just it's it's going alright. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad uh, I'm glad you're uh, sort of getting back into it as well. It's nice to see someone that. Actually, for me, just I, I grew up in League of Legends, UK League of Legends, when you were kind of making your your uh, comeuppance as well. So it's nice to see you back at this level. Um, I've actually got a question about Monster as as a team. How did you form? Was it were you approached individually, or did you guys have like a, a kind of a unit that you worked with to, to get to Monster? Uh, I mean, they were holding tryouts, and um, you know, I tried out and. I mainly want. I had like a few people I wanted to play, like a list of names, and Shikari and Heva were both of them. Um, and Monster were like pretty much the only team that were like they communicated really well on who they like that they were talking with them and to get them into the team. And then the mid and AD kind of just came out of nowhere, like kind of spontaneous. So that was that was a good find. Yeah, I, I look like you guys are gelling together quite well. And uh, that's, that's the kind of dial in on this game here. Um, it wasn't clean, obviously. There was there was definitely some some sort of uh, squeaky moments in the game. But was there was there any point in this game that you thought it might have been out of your hands, uh, or or did you do you think at any point that you kind of lost control of of your win conditions? Uh, not really. Uh, I felt like we just weren't playing that well and we weren't really playing towards our win conditions. And even when we were, we weren't doing like a great job. Uh, I felt like as a team, we performed really poorly and maybe individually, I can at least speak for myself. I don't think I did like the greatest job. Um, however, we had like a, a solid draft. We had a way to play the game and um, yeah, we executed. Yeah, I think so. Um, I, I think specifically that final call. Uh, what, what happened in there in sort of the last 30 seconds of the game? Was was there any kind of indecision about ending or did you just kind of say, well, let's see if we can end, let's get in there. Like, talk, talk me through that final sort of 30 seconds of the game. We we knew we could end because uh, Oriana had Noir and we had Ezra Yumi who have like quite a lot of range and they can always heal up the damage. And I had like flash kick ready. So it was kind of hard to defend against Baron minions for them. And yeah, it was, we, we knew we could end basically. Yeah, uh, well, honestly, uh, good to see you guys. I predicted you, so I'm very happy that you got the win because <laughs> it's nice for my predictions. Honestly, great, really great to talk to you again, Max Law. Uh, I again wish you a lot of luck going forward in the NLC. Hopefully, we'll see you uh, continue to rise in professional League of Legends once more. Cheers. Thank you very much. Nice, nice to hear from Max Law, actually. Uh, again, like not someone that we've seen uh, much of in the last year or so. So it's good to see him back in the saddle, guys. I, I would love to get your thoughts on it, but I'm going to have to go to a quick break. Uh, when we're back, we will uh, dive into our third game of the day.